again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. We're continuing on in our study of the evidence of a redeemed life. This is our seventh part, seventh chapter in this. So we're glad that you can join us. Uh, we look forward to this time of fellowship in His Word. We're here with we're here John, with and, John Lynn. and Lynn here being Waynesville, North Carolina, just outside of Asheville, Yay. where it snowed this morning. Yes, it did. Yes. Okay. Snow to sin. Snow to sin. Well, <laughs> not quite. Before we start, I'm going to ask my brother John if you would just ask God's blessing on our time. Lord God, we thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for this time together and for an opportunity to listen to your word and learn from you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the fellowship we have just the close family that you have put us into. And I pray that this will just be fruitful and open up the ears of those who need to hear the word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, uh, if you've been following us, by the way, if you haven't seen these before, they all the previous six chapters are available online here on BibleTalk.com. Uh, but what we're looking at is, well, let me let me read you a verse. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? That's 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Um, the purpose of this study was to look at ourselves, do a self-examination, and see where we are in our relationship with the Lord. Christ has given us new life, and therefore there should be new lifestyle. Our life should look different than it was, because we're, we're new creations, we're new creatures, all right? That's right? So that's what we started out with, and it just wound up right away going into the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you'll know them by their fruit. So we have, in the past, we've been looking at the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that brings us, in this time, to the next one, which is faithfulness. Now, the King James says faith, okay. all right? It's, it, it is about faith and faithfulness. Martin Luther, <clears throat> responsible for, you know, way back when in the 50, early 1500s for the Protestant Reformation, because he rediscovered faith as he was doing his studies in the, in the letter to the Romans. Because by that point, the idea of salvation by faith had gone by the wayside, right? And that's what he kind of rediscovered. But he wrote, when he wrote, he did a commentary on the letter to the Romans, and one of the things he said was, faith is not what some people think it is. Well, he was absolutely right. <clears throat> so I, I want to ask you before we start, to answer this question first, what is faith? Now, if your answer was, from Hebrews 11.1, 1, that's a good answer. Because we talked about this last week, is that God doesn't, you know, this is not a game with God. It says He gives us everything pertaining to life and Godliness. So He gives us the definition of faith. We don't have to guess at this, right? And in Hebrews 11, 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So if that was your answer, you did good. 100%. 100%. So that's the definition of faith. But what's faithfulness? I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you my definition of faithfulness. Okay. My definition is faithfulness is keeping a covenant, a solemn oath. That's what faithfulness is, keeping a covenant. Now that's the knowing of what they are. Okay. But then the question becomes, if you know it. Do you understand it? You can know that when you put your key in the car and start the engine, you can get in and put it in P or D or whatever you put it in here. And I've been driving for a while. And, and drive away. You're doing right? right numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right. Now, you, you don't have to understand the workings of an internal combustion engine to get in the car and drive it. You have to be obedient to certain things because it's not going to run 
unless you put it in the right gear. It's not going to run unless you put fuel in it. All right. So there are things that you have to you have to obey certain rules, but you don't have to understand how an internal combustion engine works. Or, for example, you can walk over and throw the light switch on the wall and have every expectation that the lights will come on. That doesn't mean that you have to know how the power plant generated the electricity or how an electrician wired your house. In other words, you can have you can know what it is without understanding how it works, right? Okay. But when it comes to the Word of God, which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, our God who breathes life into these words desires that we both know and understand. And He provides. All right? It says in Proverbs 2 6, for the Lord gives wisdom, from His mouth come knowledge and understanding. So His Word gives both. It gives us the knowing of a thing, and it's supposed to give us the understanding of a thing. The problem is, when it comes to faith and faithfulness, my experiences in traveling a good portion of the world, teaching and preaching for a lot of years, would seem to indicate that, unfortunately, while many know what faith is, that Hebrews 11, 1, they don't understand what it is. Okay? They don't understand what faith is. They don't understand what faith is. That's why there's so much bad teaching on faith. And there is an incredible amount of bad teaching on faith, okay? So we're gonna we're gonna that's what we're doing here now. In order for us to, to examine our own lives and see if faith and faithfulness are operating in our lives, we've got to understand what they are. Right. We have to know what they are and we have that to understand what we have to understand them, yeah. Sure. So Solomon, the wisest man because of the wisdom that God gave him, listen to what he wrote. This is all from Proverbs. Acquire understanding. Get understanding. Call understanding your intimate friend because fools die for a lack of understanding. While understanding produces favor, so much so that understanding is to be chosen above silver, for understanding is a fountain of light. All right, that's from a whole bunch of different Proverbs, but that's what it says. So we know what faith is. The Lord clearly defined it for us in Hebrews 1, 11, 1. But now let's examine ourselves. Because remember, this isn't about trying to figure out how we judge or examine other people. The purpose of this study is for us to look at ourselves and see where we are in our faith. Okay? That's what the Word of God says. Examine yourself. <coughs> because we are the redeemed. So there should be that evidence in our lives, right? The, a lot of times you can see what something is more clearly by understanding what it's not. Okay? The opposite of faith is fear. Right? Now both of them come by hearing. One by the word, the other by the world. It says in Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So if you're listening to the word of God, that's going to build faith in you. Faith is going to come into your life. But David, truly a man after God's own heart, right, said this, because of the voice of the enemy, fear and trembling come upon me, and horror has overwhelmed me. So even David, when he listened to the world, instead of listening to the word, he became fearful and horrified. That's what will happen to you. If it will happen to David, don't think it won't happen to you. If you're listening to getting your instruction from the world, you're going to wind up with fear. You make the choice of what you choose to listen to. And remember, Jesus said, be careful what you listen to. But it's up to you to decide whether you're going to listen to what the word of God says or what the world has to say. Okay, so, got it? The opposite of faith is fear. The opposite of faithfulness is adultery. Being faithful. The breaking of the covenant. There is no greater covenant that I know of from a spiritual point of view than the covenant that a man and a woman make when they are joined together as one flesh in marriage. They make a vow, a solemn vow to one another. Right? If you break that vow, you're being faithless. 
Right? Listen, God's, God said this. God attests to this because he talks about the adulteries of faithless Israel when the people refused to obey his voice. Right? Over and over and over. He talks about their adulteries. Yet, he said, if they would repent and return, then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you on knowledge and understanding. Jeremiah 3.15. I promise you this ties together. <clears throat> knowledge and understanding. So, I want to ask you two hypothetical questions here. Ready? Let's, I'm just picking, it, I'm picking somebody at random. So, I'm going to talk about the Apostle Matthew. Right? Was it was was Matthew a man of faith? Did he have faith? Yes. Absolutely. Right? We're going to get the right answer. Well, no. Yeah. Don't answer with your <laughs> yeah. But, but it's true. Yeah. I mean, he had faith. Right? So let me ask you another question. Was his wife faithful to him? Well, they don't talk about it. I don't know whose wife was. No, but you know. But see, the question is, it, I said it's a hypothetical question. But the, because the point is, if you ask about somebody having faith, do I have faith? Yes. Is Alice faithful? If I ask, if I ask if Alice is faithful, in the context of you know somebody, it, it, the first thing is because where is the world taking this? It's like is she cheating on me? That that's what the way we think of faithful right. in the world. Right? Is a husband being faithful to his wife? In relationships. That's we don't we think in about. terms of God's faith right. with that question. No, we think about relationships. We think about another. or the breaking of relationships. Right? right? Mm -hmm. that, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. To the world, and in my experience, most of the churches, under, you know, common kind of understanding, these two generally don't connect. You talk about faith and you're talking about religious stuff. Right. Exactly. You talk about faithfulness and you're talking about, well, is that guy cheating on his wife or right? right. You're not thinking it's, about it it's like words. two different subjects. Yes. Yeah. But in fact, they are exactly the same. Which is why the King James can say faith when the New American Standard that I'm using says faithfulness. Right? Because they're in complete agreement when one calls the fruit of the spirit faith and the other faithfulness. We know what faith is. Here's understanding. Faith is the absolute trust in God's faithfulness. Yes. And that is exactly the same as God's description in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Just different words. Because our assurance. Right, we have an assurance. We have an assurance. He's not going to cheat on us. He's not going to cheat on us. How do I know that? Well, let me ask you this. So the real question at hand is if we, if we look at ourselves and seek the evidence of redeemed life, which is Christ in us, am I faithful to God? But, but really the question is, is do I have faith that God is faithful to me? This is what I want to show you. Because that becomes the real question. Because you, if you don't believe that God is faithful to you, I'm talking about you personally, You'll never be faithful to Him. You'll never have faith. You're faithful. You won't have, you'll never be sure of God. You'll never be sure of His promises until you know that He is faithful. Right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He doesn't just tell the truth. He is the truth. It's written, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. Romans 3.4. God cannot lie. That's what Scripture says, right? Think about these Scriptures. It says in Joshua 21, not one of the good promises which the Lord has made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. Not one promise failed to come to pass. In 1 Kings, it says, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised not one word has failed of all his good promises which he promised to Moses his servant. And I actually shared this with you the other day. It's interesting to note 
that the Hebrew word for promise is dabar. That's the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word for word is dabar. It is inconceivable to God that he would speak a word that is not a promise. Every word he speaks is a covenant. Because any, everything that he says is, is accomplished. It's Absolutely. Done. It's not like it's going to happen. It's already been completed in the past. Absolutely. He calls things in, in existence. Right. Right? But the thing is, until you're sure of that, if you, until you understand that you can't separate anything in his word from it being a promise to being a covenant that he's made with you. If God said it, if he doesn't do that, he's not faithful. The only thing that can get in the way is us. If we are not living that redeemed life. It's like I said, if, if I tell you, go put the key in the ignition in my car, and you know you can turn it and, and drive it away, that's true. I may say to you, well, you're going to have to put gas in. I mean, you're going to have to put the key in the ignition. You're going to have to open the door. There, there are things you have to do. It's not like you're. It's not like the car is blessing you because you put the key in. And you're not being blessed by God because of your works. But if you don't do these things, it's not going to work. So we have to be obedient to what He has commanded us to do. We. That's why He has given us His word, the bar. That's why He has given us His promise, the bar which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path to guide us in the ways that we should go and teach us how to do the things we're supposed to do. But we've got to do that. Like he told the blind man in John to go and wash. Now, if he didn't do it, he wouldn't see. Uh, to the Lord, every word spoken is a promise. Did he say that to the blind man? To go and wash? In the pool of so long. Yeah. Yes, he did say that. Yeah. John chapter 9, <laughs> did good. Bless you. To the Lord, a word spoken is a promise. Every word spoken is a solemn covenant. Now, we're supposed to be imitators of God. That's why he said we're responsible for every careless word that comes out of our mouth. And we tend to be very careless in the natural and what things we say. If you say something, you know, I, I've said this a lot of times, if you, want us, if you want people to see a redeemed life in you, to see Christ at work in you, I, there's one thing that I honestly believe that would change the way every non-Christian looks at Christians. It says we're to be imitators of God, right? It, the Word of God says that, and I quoted this, He watches over His Word to perform. If we watched over our words to perform, in other words, you tell somebody you're going to do something, that do it. Regardless of what it costs you. In the world we live in today, that's so uncommon. People say things all the time. And it just, you know, kind of doesn't happen. <coughs> okay? They'll have a reason why they couldn't do it. It's a, which is, our, that's excuses. Exactly. Right? They'll, they'll always give you excuses why it didn't happen. Well, excuses are, ready? The fiery arrows shot from the pits of hell to kill the <laughs> pigs. <laughs> from the pits. From the pits of hell. Not even the Oscars. <laughs> So, a lack of faith in the Lord's faithfulness. Yes. That's what keeps us from promises. That's right. But no trusting. And it says anything not done in faith is sin. So, a lack of faith in the Lord's faithfulness is not only a sin, because it says whatever is not a faith is sin, but it is the highest insult that one can attempt to heap upon Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You ever think about it? Insulting Jesus Christ. It is to call him a liar. Does that does that hurt him? Yeah. 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 Well, let me tell you what Ezekiel thought. Ezekiel said when he when he was talking about talk, now Ezekiel is a prophet that God is using to call God's people to, back into a right relationship because they're doing their own thing, right? And and God speaks to him and God says, "How I have been hurt." by their adulterous hearts which turned away from me. I don't think we think about that. That when, when we're doing these things, when we're not trusting God. We don't think about the economy. No, we don't think of it in these terms. That's because we don't understand we don't understand it. We're so selfish in thinking about 
because we don't understand it. That's why I'm trying to tell you that what we need to do is understand faithfulness. Because when, we, when we're not trusting God to do what he said in our lives, we're calling him a liar, and we're hurting him by our, because that's adultery. And he's been hurt by our adulterous hearts. Does man lack of, man's lack of trust pain him? Well, think of this verse, what Jesus, about Jesus in Luke 19. It said, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. He wept over it. Why? Because they had refused to receive his promise, his gift. They refused to trust him. They refused to trust him. And he wept over it. And if they're not trusting him, they're trusting in themselves, leaning on their own understanding. Absolutely. Get things done, not trusting in him. I mean, I, I, you know, we always, you don't have to do it anything, Lord. We'll take care of it. We always think in terms of ourselves. But that's, you know, this is a relationship. Christ is the bridegroom, and we're the bride. And in this relationship, if if Alice didn't trust me, I promise you, it would cause me pain. In my life. May God forbid that I give her any ever give her reason not to trust me. Right? Because she should have faith in me. She should have faith Confidence. in my faithfulness. Yes. Yes. That's a, that's a right faith relationship. Your relationship. But, well, that's where it starts because you know my faithfulness, my faithfulness is based on him in me. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So, I mean, that's the kind of, why, why do you think so many married couples are miserable? Because they don't trust one another. I mean, they're not, they don't have that bond. And that bond can only come starting from a right relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to we need to understand that it's not just a matter of us getting or not getting. When we're not believing His promises that He's going to do what He said He would do, that's what that's what faithfulness is. Remember, faith is trusting in the faithfulness of God. It's an assurance of things hoped for. Okay. I know that I trust that house is faithful. To me, I don't see her every morning, but I have an assurance. I have the evidence of things not seen. I see, I see her in her life. I know that Alice is faithful. It says in the last days. It says, it says in the last days, men will be lovers of self. We, we tend to think of everything in terms of ourself. We don't think in terms of Jesus. No, no, right. Is this affecting Jesus? I got to share a story with you. I, I think I've shared this in a couple of other places. But, uh, Alice and I lived, before we went on the road full time, a little homeless kind of, uh, we lived in an apartment in Orlando, Florida, that we rented from a dear brother who lived in upstate New York, like 1,400 miles away from where we were there. And we lived there, he had three apartments, and we watched the other two for him. But we were then at a place where we had to live by faith, by trusting in God, because the fact of the matter was, we, we, never, we didn't have enough income to pay the rent. But every month, God would do something. You know, and something would happen, and I'd have the money to pay the rent. We'd always go out and preach or do something, you know. We had enough to pay some of them, but not, not, not all. Yeah. Yeah. So, as you may know, in 2008, the economy tanked and the housing market tanked. It really went south. Well, this brother uh, is in the housing kind of business. He a contractor up in New York, and he was, it was really affecting him. So, this one month, Again, I didn't have enough money to pay the rent, but my, my thought was, and I don't know why I was so overwhelmed by it, I kept saying to, I kept saying, and I'm, this is, I'm having a conversation with the Lord, which is called prayer, and I'm saying, you know, if I can't pay the rent, Lord, what's he going to do? Right? If I don't have enough money to pay the rent, how's it going to affect me? The fact was, I really wasn't concerned about myself because I know that God has taken care of Alice I mean, we have good evidence of that. But I kept saying to the Lord, and it really was a burden on me, that if I couldn't pay the rent that month, I didn't know what would happen to that brother up in New York. So I'm going on and on and on. 
And all of a sudden, it was like a tap. You know, it talks about that still small voice. And I heard, I can't explain it to you, I'll tell you the fact. I heard the voice of the Lord say to me, Why are you planning on me to fail? I felt like I'd been slapped across the face. Because I hadn't thought about it like that. But that's exactly what my lack of faith was. I was it, that's the way that's the way he saw it, because he told me that's the way he saw it. That I was I was planning on him to fail. It wasn't about my faith, it wasn't about that brother's faith. It was me accusing God of not keeping his word. Because he says in Philippians chapter 4, he would supply all of my needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That apartment was not just some toy, some plaything, some some want. That was a need in our lives. And God said, I'll supply that need. And here I am, I'm thinking about it. he's not going to do it. I'm not, I'm not even conscious of my thought path until he says to me, why are you planning on me to fail? And it was like it would pain him, but it surely pained me to hear those words. So interestingly enough, at that time, I was doing a regular weekly uh, internet sh television show, I'll call it, an internet broadcast, with a brother in Winter Park, Florida, who's a pastor of a church there. And every Wednesday we would do a two-hour live broadcast over the internet using equipment from TechWorks. <laughs> and <How> special this week. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went on. I went on the broadcast that morning, and the first thing I did was, you know, it says confess your sins one to another. So the first thing I did was I, I confessed this, and I repented of it publicly on on that broadcast that I was basically accusing Jesus of being prepared to fail. So anyway, I did. I repented in front of everybody and we went on. And when we finished, I had the car parked in the parking lot. And Alice and I went out and got in the car and we started to drive off. Before I got out of the parking lot, before I got out of the parking lot, my phone rings, my cell phone rings. So I answered the phone. Remember now, this is in Orlando, Florida. I get a telephone call and it's a woman in Seattle, Washington. Now, you can't get much farther apart in the United States of America between Orlando, Florida, and Seattle, Washington. And this woman says to me, I see that you have a domain name that you don't appear to be using. And that was the case. I had had a, a few domain names, and I wasn't using this one. I hadn't used it. And she asked me if I would be willing to sell it. So I said to her, well, I, I might be. I said, yeah, would you like to make me an offer on it? Well, when she offered me exactly the amount that I needed for the rent, I knew that God had done two things. He had watched over his word to perform it and supplied my need, but he had blessed my repentance. Received you. Yes. He must have been tuned into that broadcast. But that's the way it's supposed to be. I mean, we're supposed to have this relationship with Jesus Christ where we are confident, we have an assurance. What do you hope for? I mean, the only thing I hope for is this right relationship with God. Because for God, nothing is impossible. I want to tell you, there's a lot of stuff impossible for me. But nothing is impossible with Him. And if I am walking in faith, I have the faith to move mountains. There's nothing impossible for the God inside me. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. So are you. If you are walking in the faith, this is what we're examining ourselves. Are we trusting in God? Or are we calling him a liar? That's the only two choices. Are we calling him faithless? It is that cut and dried. It is that black and white. It is that harsh. It's not just a matter of, oh, I didn't do good. Oh, I didn't have the faith. It's not about receiving, receiving, receiving. If you read the entire chapter of Hebrews 11, you'll find out that God's faith in us gives us the power to obey, to give. It says, by faith, by faith Abel offered unto God. It says, by faith Abraham offered and obeyed. It says, by faith Moses turned his back on the world. We're, that's where this life, this redeemed life, this victorious life in Christ Jesus comes from. It's not in us trying to be such perfect Christians, but trying to remember that our God is a perfect God. And his love for us, that he is faithful to us. If we have faith in the fact that he is faithful to us, 
We will walk in the blessings of Hebrew 11. I promise you. The Apostle Paul brings this forth the best way I know how. Right? The evidence of redeemed life. Because he says in Romans chapter 8, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? You understand what Paul's saying? If God the Father gave his son Jesus Christ to meet your need, and if I want to tell you that was the greatest need you ever had, that was the greatest need I ever had, it was a need for salvation, to be right with God the Father. And it was something I could not do on my own, it was something you and you and you and you could not do on your own. So God, in his love, sent Jesus Christ to do it for us. And if he would do that, at the cost of Jesus on the cross, you think he's not going to give you a loaf of bread when you need a loaf of bread? Or a full tank of gas when you need a tank of gas? Or uh, the money for a rent when you need it? Really? And he'll never do it the way you think. But the point is, I mean, well, if we're, exactly. yeah, but if we're examining exactly. ourselves to see if, we, if we're bearing the evidence of a redeemed life, can, can you see in your own life this trust in God? Because if you can't see, and I'm serious, if you can't see in your own life that you are trusting in God for everything, I promise you nobody else is going to see it. And it's not, if you think that you're impressing people because you walk through the door of the church building on Sunday, you're not. Lots of people do. And lots of people who don't even have a right relationship with God. But when they see your personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and it doesn't get more personal than that. And that's why he calls faithlessness adultery. You're cheating on People can see that. People can, I, I, I'm not saying it's boastful, but I know that people can see the relationship that Alice and I have. I mean, that should be fairly evident. She's very nice to me. I try. Okay. Good job. Yeah. I have confidence in Alice. But more than that, I have confidence in God. Confidence comes from the Latin words, confide, with faith. Confidence is my faith in God. The people in the world lack confidence. And well, they should. People in the world, they, they're not confident about their homes, they're not confident about their, their jobs, and they don't have confidence about their political leaders, they don't have confidence about peace in the world, the economy, their health, not even their spouses. And with good reason. Because those things are not faithful. God is. He is the only one who will never fail. You know, I just talked about you know walking through the doors of a church building. We seem to think in the church today, particularly in the Western world, that Christianity is about building big buildings and having pretty choirs. And we, we, we think a lot of things. But the Word of God says, will God, not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? Remember, I think I said this to you the other day when we were just having a conversation. So many Christians believe that the Bible says God helps those who help themselves. Never has it been a bigger life in the pits of hell than that. You can't help yourself. But God helps those who cry out for help to him, right? So how long will he delay over, over us, right? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, when Jesus comes, it says, will he find faith on earth? It doesn't say is he going to find nice, pretty big church buildings. It says will he find faith. And that what I'm trying to tell you is that true faith is not about, oh, I had faith to get this, I had faith to... It's about true faith is about trusting in His faithfulness. True faith is about just trusting God, okay? We've already looked in this study about having peace that passes understanding, and we've examined ourselves to ensure that this peace that only Jesus can give is evident in our lives. That was one of the first of the, right? Love, joy, peace, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That peace is ultimately based on our assurance that he's faithful. 
a fact that will be evident to all on that great and terrible day of the Lord. You have faith because you trust God. You're confident that if he gave his only begotten son, God the Father, he's going to take care of anything that's going on in your life. He will deliver you. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver us out of them all. Right? It says, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it, you know who this is? This is Jesus Christ, riding that white horse. The one who sat on it is called faithful and true. He doesn't lie, and he's faithful. And in righteousness he judges and wages wars. His eyes are a flame of fire. This is the one, he's coming back. I said, I had a vision one day. I think it's a vision. I mean, I was sitting around praying. And it was like, all of a sudden, I felt like I was in the throne of God. And there's God the Father. I didn't see him, but he knew he there. And Jesus is seated on his right hand. And all the saints who are going on before us are there. And myriads and myriads. That must be a lot. I don't know how to count them. Myriads. Lots of angels are there. The host of heaven, right? And they're all sitting around chatting. No? Sure. Praising God. Worshiping, worshiping the Father. Praise God. But all of a sudden, the Father turns to Jesus and says, Get the horse. It's time. Can you imagine the ripple that will go through that heavenly host? I don't know what the time is, but the time is coming. God the Father is going to say, and I don't think it's too far to Jesus, get the horse, it's time. Faithful, true, the Word of God. That's Jesus Christ. You and I need to examine ourselves to see if indeed we're confident in His promises. We're confident in His Word in our own lives. I mean, you believe that He will keep His promises. Yes. By the way, if you don't know His Word, you're not going to know what the promises yeah. are. Word and promise, the same thing. A, a lot of Christians, they don't, they don't trust God to do something because they don't know it's one of His promises. Or a lot of times they expect Him to do something and that's not one of His promises. So they're confident in the wrong thing. This is why it's so important for us to abide in the Word. In John chapter 8, Jesus said that if you are truly my disciples, you'll abide in the Word. You'll, and those, right? If you abide in my Word, you're truly my disciples, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Otherwise, you're going to be in bondage to lies. Ah. And you know, just thinking about faith, too, there's so many people who do things and they're calling it faith because, I mean, one of the, for instance, there's this Bible, there were times when he used to preach and people would write him a check and then it would bounce and they would say, oh, we're writing it in faith. That's I mean, not yeah. no, that's not faith. No. Because God never but told them to write that. Right. But that's what I because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Right. If you have if you haven't heard it from God, you have exactly. no reason yeah. to have faith for it. But that's why I said there's so much bad teaching in the church today about faith. There's so much bad teaching about prayer. And I mean these are the foundations of a relationship with God. Prayer is conversation, not, it's not you talking to God, it's you talking with God. It's conversation. And I promise you, the hearing part, what he has to say is more important than what you have to say. It says he already knows before you can think or ask what you need. Right? So you're not accomplishing an awful lot. I mean, you don't have to convince him. What's more important is us hearing him, because that builds faith. It sure does. Absolutely. So we have to have... but. When people start to teach that prayer is about you going back, you know, and, and bombarding God with I want this, I want this, I want this. And if you just say the, the right words are like faith, you can confess just the right words. Then God, like a like a genie out of a bottle, like you know, you're rubbing him, and he has to pop out and start granting your wishes. I mean, if you're having a conversation with God so that you can know what he wants and you grant his wishes. It's about you being obedient. Abraham, we are the servants. in Romans, Paul calls Abraham, in, in a, kind of in the natural, the father of our faith. Well, in Hebrews 11, it says, by faith, Abraham obeyed. The purpose of faith is to give us the power to obey the word of God. And he he take, us. He'll take care of the rest of the stuff. You know, I, I talk about this a, a lot of times. If you have a child, if you have a young child, does that child have to, mommy, does he have to come up and convince you to make him dinner every night? 
Daddy, does he have to con come up and convince you that you'll allow him to sleep in the house tonight? No, you do these things because you love them. Well, I promise you, our Father in Heaven loves you, us children, more than you love your children. What are we doing? I don't know. Okay. Doing it the hard way. Before, I'm going to open this to questions, so get your phones ready. I want to end this portion of our study with a look at the greatest example of faith and faithfulness that the world has ever seen. That which the Apostle Paul said would be the center, the focus of his teaching, and surely the center of his own life. He wrote to the Corinthians, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul knew and understood what he wrote to the church in Philippi about Jesus. He wrote to, to, to the Philippians and said, talking about Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Emptied himself. It wasn't about what he could get. He had the faith to empty himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He was obedient to something far harsher than God has ever called you to do. Oh yes, he calls you to deny yourself. He calls you to die to yourself. But he has given you life and given you life eternal. Okay? Jesus went to that cross because he trusted his Father completely. He had faith enough to faithfully face death, even death on a cross, with humility and gentleness. Which, by the way, is the next of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I told you, they're always all linked together. They're always connected. So in our next session of this study, we're going to look at the fruit of the Spirit that is gentleness, meekness, humility. Before you, I'm, I'm, I'm going anywhere. Alice wants to ask you a question. No, I was just, when you said uh, something you just said, I don't remember what it was, but it just made me think of uh, when Jesus said, He's not found greater faith. Than oh, for the centurion, yes. Because the centurion, I, I don't know if you know the account that Alice is talking about. A Roman soldier, a Roman soldier, a centurion, came to Jesus and said, My son is ill. And Jesus immediately said, didn't that be, didn't even have to be asked. Jesus immediately said, let's go. Let's go to him. And the centurion said, no, I'm not worthy that you should come into my house. Jesus spoke a word that that child was healed then and there without going. But he said, to the, he said about that centurion, he said he had not found such great faith in all of Israel. I've done this, and you know, I travel the world and I preach. I ask pastors, groups that do teachings of pastors, I say, you know, if you think about faith in the Bible, who are the people that immediately come to your mind? They'll talk about Abraham, they'll talk about Paul, they'll talk about you know, Elijah, they'll talk about all these people. And I said, what about the centurion? Because Jesus said he hadn't found such great faith in all of Israel, but this Roman soldier. And you know what the Roman soldier said? He said, I understand authority. He said, I understand authority. He said, I'm a man under authority. I'm a man with authority. If I, if somebody, you know what he's saying? If, if my commander tells me to do something, I do it. If I tell one of my soldiers to do something, he does it. He said to Jesus, I know if you speak the word, it's done. Do we not, do we not have at least as much faith as a Roman soldier? I mean, not, not one of the people of God, not somebody who had been walking in discipleship with Jesus Christ, but he understood God's power and authority, and he understood the faithfulness of God. But if you ask, ask and you shall receive. So, you guys, have any comments? Questions that Alice can answer for you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but again, let me just close by saying this. The purpose of this study is for, for, as it started, for me to examine my own life and make sure that I see the evidence of God's work in you. 
And I, I, you know, I wanted to share that because this is something we should do. It says uh, more than once that a man examine himself. So we should be doing this. Where are we spiritually? It's a reasonable question to ask yourself. And it's a question that demands an answer. So Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for your work in us. That we're not dependent on our own ability, but we're dependent upon your love, your work in our lives. That the work that you've begun in our lives, you are able to complete. That you, Lord, are transforming us and bringing us from glory to glory. That your call in our lives is an upward call. That you are the potter and we're the clay. That you are forming us, you're shaping us, you're molding us into exactly what you desire we should be. My prayer is, Lord, that we would be faithful to you who are faithful. That we would have faith in you. That we would not doubt that you would do the things that you promised to do. That we would just lay ourselves in your hands because we have confidence, assurance of your love for us. So we praise you and we thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for choosing to make us temples of your Holy Spirit. Let that light shine through us that you might be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, before we go, as always, I know that Alice wants to tell you Jesus loves you a lot. God bless you and goodbye till next time.